right choice, Japan for the best. The best ass reaming. That'd be extra. Hey guys, Q here. Warning of spoilers for Breaking Bad, El Camino, and Better Call Saul to Season 6, Episode 7, the Season 6 mid-season finale. In this video, I'll be breaking down and discussing Episode 607, giving it a full review and recap. Like the video if you end up enjoying it, subscribe to the channel, and follow me on Twitter for more Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad updates. If you really enjoy what I do here, maybe even consider checking out my Patreon, or give back to the channel by clicking the Super Thanks button under the video. With that being said, let's jump into the breakdown. After the intro title sequence, we cut to the Casimiro body double, Lenny, pushing carts at a grocery store. He's quoting the Roy Khan monologue from Angels in America, as confirmed by Tom Schnoz, both in the Insider podcast and during his article interview with Hollywood Reporter. Apparently, it was just supposed to be a placeholder for something else, but they never changed it and got permission to use it. I believe Angels in America is both a book and play from the early 90s, which focuses on AIDS and homosexuality in the 80s, with the main character's lover, Lee leaving him after he contracts AIDS. HBO also apparently made a miniseries about it in 2003, although I'm unsure how popular that was. The original story has won many awards and is critically acclaimed. Anyways, Lenny is rehearsing this due to clearly having a passion for acting, something that we saw in episode 606 and will again in 607. Jimmy rolls up to him in the parking lot and urges him to go with him for a reshoot. Jimmy offers $400 if Lenny gets in the car immediately and says he will talk to his boss if he gives him any grief. Lenny isn't convinced until Jimmy speaks to his passion for acting, hilariously reaching out of the passenger window to speak to him. And as they leave, you can see the row of shopping carts slowly roll towards a parked car, hitting it and causing the alarm to go off, which is just a great touch to end off the scene. We then cut to Jimmy's camera guy, Joey, teaching a filming class, most likely as a TA. He goes off about his amazing camera and tells the class that they'll be using a lesser model. A classmate mentions that the main professor said they'd be using the good cameras, but Joey objects, saying that the professor doesn't represent the views of the equipment center, but he does. I love this side character, it's definitely my favorite out of all three members of the camera crew, and I believe this is the most time we've ever seen of him in his first standalone scene. So, the good cameras? Those are for the few, the proud. The auteurs, capiche? It's great seeing that he always acts so monotone yet witty in general, and not just around Jimmy. Joey's character feels like a constant state of someone rolling their eyes, and I love every moment of it. As I've said before in previous videos, Better Call Saul Season 6 is seemingly doing a victory lap with bringing back many side characters from previous seasons, giving them a swan song send-off, but in a way that does relate to the current Season 6 story so it doesn't feel like filler. Not only do we see that with the camera crew, but other characters as well later on in the episode. Jimmy opens the door to grab Joey, who says he has more important business on campus and that there will possibly be a quiz later. I love the rushed goodbyes Joey gives the class as he even says, Fair warning, there's gonna be a quiz later, probably. Don't touch the equipment, I'll know. As he walks out the door, Joey uses leverage on this being an emergency situation to get a huge payday out of Jimmy, as he knows that Jimmy needs him. If you think this is the same, feel free to go find someone else. What, no, 500, fine, Jesus. Five. Joey gets a $400 raise from $100 to $500, so that's $900 just between the camera guy and the body double that Jimmy is paying so far. He tells Joey to keep this to himself, so I assume that he'll be paying the drama girl and the sound guy each $100, making this about $1,100. So they meet up with the body double and the makeup drama girl with the camera guy joking that she wandered too far away from the Shire. I also thought that she initially looked straight out of Lord of the Rings, but she corrects Joey by saying that she's Kira the Gelfling from Dark Crystal, which is just awesome. Sound guy runs over into the scene dressed up as a jogger, which they end up using to their advantage as well as we'll see later on. And as a side note, only the camera guy actually has a name, Joey Dixon, while the other two are just known as Drama Girl and Sound Guy. I don't even recall when Joey's name was revealed, probably just during some minor dialogue in an earlier season, as usually he's also just referenced as Camera Guy. So as Kim arrives, Jimmy asks Kim if she's sure she wants to do this. He tells her to get back in the car to bust the speed limit and that she'll make it to Santa Fe by lunch. This is yet another chance for Kim to go to the Santa Fe meeting, but she has fully gone down Bad Choice Road, and she wants to be here instead. You're sure of this? Absolutely sure. You get back in the car, bust the speed limit, and you'll still make that lunch. Timmy, this is where I need to be. 
Look out for a future video where I'll be discussing Kim skipping out of the Santa Fe meeting and what that means for her character. We then get a continuous shot circling around all the characters preparing the body double for his new shoot with a cast. Kim haphazardly wraps a makeshift cast around him, with Joey mocking the fact that that's even supposed to look like a cast. Lenny gets excited saying, oh, here, oh, here. The plot thickens, this changes everything. Nothing changes. Asking for a new backstory, and then Jimmy says that the broken arm is symbolic, which Lenny totally falls for. Jimmy gives him direct that he's on a covert mission to accept a very important package and to act casual but with a touch of mystery. Absolutely love these scenes with the camera crew and Lenny, it's fun, upbeat, and hilarious. It's also crazy how the episode starts out so happy-go-lucky so to speak, but as the episode goes on it just gets darker and darker. Drama Girl uses a reflector for lighting with the sound guy hilariously having a single branch on the end of his boom mic stick, replicating the picture being taken from behind a bush or some foliage. Their first take goes wrong, with Lenny facing away from the camera. Kim directs them to turn around, and as a small nitpick, it's kinda unrealistic that Jimmy is acting so clueless here, as normally he does a great job with directing his own commercials. I feel like the creators wrote it this way to give Kim more of a purpose for being there to, you know, give her reasoning why she didn't just go to the Santa Fe meeting, and it seems kinda sloppy in regards to Jimmy not knowing how to properly direct it himself, kind of seeming out of character. What? What is she, what is she saying? Jimmy and Lenny don't understand her from that distance, so Kim throws off her shoes and runs over to correct them. As she runs back, Joey yells out that her shoes are in the shot, causing her to go grab them. I do like this touch of Kim's shoes getting in the way, as it's a relatable moment of trying to do something quicker, but then ending up frustratingly taking more time in the long run. We then see Jimmy and Kim in the dark room with Joey as he processes the fake PI photos. Jimmy asks how it's going, and Joey just keeps saying, Can't rush the process. Can't rush the process. Even though that's exactly what they're trying to do. Jimmy and Kim start grabbing finished photos and lacing them with the topical drug that they got from Caldera in the previous episode. Joey asks what they're doing, but Jimmy says it's on a need-to-know basis. They eventually get impatient enough with the process that they just yoink the final few photos and get on their way. We then see the reveal that Jimmy was running over to give the photos of the body double to Howard's PI, who was secretly working for them the whole time. This is a crazy moment that blew my mind upon first viewing. If you have a keen eye for detail, you would have also noticed that the package that Jimmy hands Lenny at the bench is the same package that the PI previously showed Howard a photo of, with Jimmy supposedly withdrawing a large cash sum from a bank, already implying that the PI was in on the con before the PI reveal even happens. So we then cut to HHM, as Howard is preparing for the mediation meeting. As newbie Carrie walks in to restock the fridge, he dumps a bunch of the cans on the ground. Howard teaches him a trick that if you twirl a shaken up can by the lid, the centrifugal force pulls the bubbles from the inside of the can so it doesn't explode. Howard tells Carrie that they don't want to give their clients a surprise, but oh boy is that the understatement of the episode. The cans will end up being the least of Howard's worries. Howard says that he learned this trick from Chuck, saying how he'd do this trick every single can out of habit without even thinking about it. This idea actually came from Tom Schnoz due to his dad teaching him that in the past. Try it out if you dare, but for the most part it really does work. What's depressing is the fact that newbie Carrie doesn't even know who Chuck is, how he got hired at HHS without knowing who the McGill in Hamlin Hamlin McGill is just baffles me, but maybe it's due to no one speaking about Chuck publicly due to his mental condition that led to his suicide. Howard says that Chuck was the greatest legal mind he ever knew, but elaborates that maybe there's more important things. This possibly implies that Howard has learned from Chuck that there's more to life than work, which is what Chuck solely dedicated his life to, just for it to crumble down around him. And this also implies that Howard does obviously care about his friends and his romantic life such as, you know, Cliff and Cheryl. And I do love the callback to Chuck, looming over the meeting room as Jimmy does the same thing to Howard that he once did to Chuck, which in both instances led to their downfall both career-wise and in general, you know, they both die. Howard's assistant then comes into the room saying his PI has arrived due to a sudden development, so Howard meets him upstairs. The PI shows Howard the photos that we saw taken earlier in the episode, leaving Howard to put two and two together during the meeting, as he doesn't even know what the mediator looks like yet due to Cliff being the one that recommended him. Howard and Cliff meet with Irene Landry, and I absolutely love that she cameos here. It makes complete sense too, since she was the chairman for her own Sandpiper location, which is what Jimmy manipulated her for in Season 3. Now speaking of manipulating her, Howard insists that she sits in a wheelchair to gain sympathy from the mediator. This once again shows that Howard isn't completely a saint, as he isn't above using perception of his clients to his advantage, something eerily similar to what Jimmy would do. Howard's drugs start kicking in due to touching the laced PI photos, and he asks Irene and Cliff if they're hot. From here 
here on out, every time the camera shows Howard, the audience is just waiting for his pupils to blow up. We see Cliff, Aaron, Howard, and Irene meet with Rick Schweikart, yet another cameo involved in the current plot. It's awesome to see all these characters together, but also unsettling considering what's about to unfold. Howard puts two and two together, calling out the mediator for taking a bribe from Jimmy, which baffles both the mediator and Rich. When Howard's assistant brings down the photos as proof, it's not what Howard's expecting, instead showing the sound guy in a mustache handing Jimmy a frisbee. Howard starts freaking out, and his pupils dilate. Howard runs out of the room to call his PI with Cliff following him, but the line is dead. In a panic, Howard runs upstairs to figure out what's going on. The mediator and Rich leave with Rich stating that they're going back to their previous offer, and subtracting a million dollars each day, the case isn't settled, leaving Cliff with no choice but to settle. Cliff goes upstairs to confront Howard, who tries explaining what's going on. After instantly realizing how Jimmy played him, drugged him, and that he hired a con man as his PI, Cliff says that it doesn't matter what he thinks, as there's no way Howard will be able to prove what he's alleging to the board, and that they'll have to settle. Meanwhile, Jimmy and Kim are listening into the whole thing due to the dial-in number that Francesca got for them in the last episode, and they end up getting it on by the end of this. I go more in depth in regards to Howard chicanery, public career embarrassment scene in my full Mediator Con Explained video that I just released previously before this review, so check that out for a more in-depth analysis and discussion if you're wondering why I'm kind of skimming over some of this. So moving on, later that night, we see Kim and Jimmy relaxing on their couch watching the 1950s movie, Born Yesterday. The movie is about a woman named Billy Dawn who moves to Washington DC with her quote-unquote sugar daddy Harry Brock, along with his sleazy lawyer Jim Devery. The lawyer Jim pressures Harry into marrying Billy due to the fact that a wife cannot be forced to testify against her husband. Ooh, sound familiar? Definitely paralleling the reason why Jimmy and Kim got married in season 5. In an effort to make Billy more socially acceptable, Harry hired a journalist, Paul Varel, to quote-unquote smarten her up and apparently sparks fly between the pair. Apologies if I got any of those names wrong. Apparently, not much thought went into actually choosing this movie for this scene with Jimmy and Kim, as Tom Schnoz confirmed in the Hollywood Reporter interview that they have a catalog of movies that they can use for free, and this one in particular just felt fun for the scene. They chose this particular scene from the movie for Jimmy and Kim to watch just because it felt fun, and they wanted to show Jimmy and Kim at their happiest before everything falls apart due to not one but two unexpected guests arriving at their apartment moments later. Howard arrives at their door, with Jimmy saying that they don't have to answer it, but they do anyways, with Kim saying they should just get it over with. Kim watches the candlelight flicker as Jimmy opens the door due to the air pressure in the apartment changing. This is also foreshadowing for just a moment. Howard asks to come in, and Jimmy obliges. Kim asks Howard if he's doing okay, and Howard says that he brought them a gift. Howard continues explaining that Chuck and him would always have a celebratory drink after a big career victory. That is a 35-year-old McAllen. Your brother and I, we always had a meeting with Mr. McAllen after a big victory. So he brought them booze for winning one over on him. This is such a thoughtful yet witty and passive aggressive way to congratulate Jimmy and Kim on screwing him over, and I love it. Jimmy and Kim play dumb, and Howard says he gets it, that they both have to play it this way, and that they're both so very good at it. Kim asks what this is all about, and Howard responds by saying he was wondering that too. As Howard finds some glasses to pour the alcohol he brought over, he states that he wonders what justification makes what they did okay, and what they tell themselves to be able to sleep at night. Howard brings up so many possible examples as to why Jimmy and Kim would plot against him, showing that he's really thought this over as if he just binge-watched the entire show from season 1 himself. Do they just think he's an asshole that deserves it, that he sided with Chuck too often, that he took Kim's office away and stuck her in doc review as punishment for too long, or that his dad helped him get to the top while they had to struggle, or even that he has so much and they have so little. I love all these examples, stirring the pot from the entire history of the show. This topic can create such an elaborate and long discussion that I'm gonna save some of my opinions and explanations for why Jimmy and Kim hate Howard and chose him as a target for a future video. And in that future video, I'll be breaking down all these reasons more in depth, along with a handful of other reasons as to why Jimmy and Kim hate Howard that Howard never even listed off during this 607 scene, so look forward to that because I know I am. So Howard tells him that this isn't just a cruel prank such as throwing bowling balls on his car which was already over the top, metaphorically and literally, but that this took planning and coordination that must have taken weeks if not months. 
During Howard's brilliant final monologue, he keeps constantly asking why they created this elaborate plan to burn him to the ground. Jimmy finally responds by saying that Howard will be fine and that he'll land on his feet. This mirrors Kim's original thought process for this whole scheme back in the season 5 finale, telling Jimmy that it'll be a minor career setback. But if you remember, Jimmy tells her that it'll be scorched earth and that he may not come back from this. We're not talking about a bar trick here. We're talking about scorched earth. We would have to hurt him. Hurt him bad. We're talking about a career setback. It's interesting how Jimmy takes Kim's rationalization instead of his own to make seem what they did to Howard not that bad. Why go through this elaborate plot just to burn me to the ground? Burn you to the ground? <laughs> Howard, come on. You, you'll be fine. You always land on your feet. Oh, yeah, sure. This is also another indirect admission of guilt from Jimmy for what they did to Howard, similar to Jimmy's first indirect admission of guilt back when he agreed to box Howard in episode 605, implying that he knew why Howard wanted to box him in the first place. Kim realizes this and stares at Jimmy with disapproval, as if she doesn't want him to admit anything, even though it's difficult to prove what they did to anyone without Howard sounding crazy, as Cliff told him earlier that day. I know what it sounds like, but you have to believe me. I... it doesn't matter. You think you're going to be able to convince them it was all Jimmy McGill? And as Bill Oakley told Jimmy earlier this season, There's proving, and then there's knowing. And Howard definitely knows. Howard admits that, although he humiliated himself, and that he'll hear whispers behind his back of fellow co-workers thinking he's a drug addict, the HHM share of the Sandpiper settlement will be significant. Howard says that he's worked his way through worse, such as debt, depression, along with his marriage falling apart. I'm not entirely sure where the debt part comes into play, either it's something that happened before the show started, or it could be hinting at the fact that Howard had to pay Chuck out of his own pocket in season 3 to force Chuck to leave HHM, also creating the troubles of a third of HHM's assets going down the drain with Chuck. As Chuck told Jimmy in season 1 if he retired and cashed out, a third of HHM would be lost, screwing over the firm financially, along with many employees losing their jobs. In order to pay out my share, suppose my partners are forced to liquidate the firm. Then what? My clients are out in the cold. My cases are scattered to the winds. 126 people lose their jobs. What happens to your cronies in the mailroom? The assistants, the paralegals, the janitorial staff, all of them out on the street. Howard's depression that he worked through was also due to Chuck's death, as we saw in Season 4 and into Season 5. Howard felt guilt for Chuck's death and developed issues such as insomnia and was having a pretty rough go of it for quite a while in Season 4. An example of this would be when Jimmy saw Howard in the courthouse bathroom, offering Howard a shrink just to have Howard admit that he already has one and a really good one at that. Howard worked through his depression and processed it properly, coming out the other side wanting to be a better man, creating his namaste lifestyle going into Season 5. But even as we went into Season 6, we saw that Howard was still going to therapy, although it was mainly due to his failing marriage, which is the next thing that Howard listed off to Jimmy and Kim. Howard says that he's been sleeping in the guest house for the better part of a year, meaning that he's had a struggling marriage ever since 2003, which is around when Chuck died. It's possible that Howard's marriage with his wife Cheryl started falling apart due to Howard's depression over Chuck, along with his wife not agreeing with his new namaste lifestyle. So from the possible debt from Chuck leaving HHM, to depression from Chuck dying, and even also linking to his failing marriage. It's all indirectly caused from Jimmy, since Jimmy pushed Chuck to kill himself and never took accountability for the guilt, instead pushing it onto Howard in the season 4 premiere. Kim knows about the chicanery of it all in regards to the Mesa Verde numbers from season 2, and the battery trick that they played on Chuck in episode 305, but Jimmy kept to himself the fact that he threw Chuck under the bus in regards to his insurance. As you may know, that was the final straw to break the camel's back and cause Chuck's condition to relapse, eventually having Chuck kill himself. It's crazy how everything horrible that Howard has gone through can all be linked back eventually to Jimmy, from the debt and depression and struggling marriage, and now everything that's happened with Sandpiper in Season 6, along with what's about to happen with Lalo. I've worked my way through worse. Debt. Depression. My marriage falling apart. Howard tells them that he will eventually land on his feet and be okay, which I wish was the path that Howard's character took, instead of what really happens to him in just a moment. But let's not get too ahead of ourselves, as Howard then reflects on Jimmy and Kim. He says that he'll be okay, but them far from it. He calls them soulless, which I have to agree with. But you? Far from it. You two. You two are soulless. The creators of the show have purposely made Jimmy and Kim do something unforgivable against Howard, and yes, I'm referencing the title of the Season 5 finale episode, as that's the episode we know that this huge Sandpiper scheme originated from. To get a bunch of lawyers to run for the exits, Howard would have to have done something unforgivable. At the end of it, he 
might never be able to practice law again. He doesn't deserve that. The creators purposely wanted Jimmy and Kim to see the unintended consequences of their actions, along with potentially making the viewers of the show start to truly dislike them. In my opinion, this is similar to how some viewers hated Walt by the end of Breaking Bad for all the things that he ended up doing throughout the show. And yes, the things that Walt has done throughout Breaking Bad are far worse than the things that Jimmy and Kim have done, just because, you know, Better Call Saul is on a lesser scale, but I think the parallel is there, and the show is purposely making us kind of hate these main characters for what they've done. As much as I dislike Jimmy and Kim for putting Howard through everything that they have, I appreciate and respect the creators writing the show this way, as it truly helps morph Jimmy into the Saul Goodman that we know from Breaking Bad. It's just because they made Jimmy so likable and sympathetic at the beginning of Better Call Saul, and they almost needed to make him hated to go into the Breaking Bad timeline as Saul Goodman. It's crazy how well this show has made me go from sympathizing for Jimmy and Kim during the first two to three seasons, to now practically hating them currently at the half way mark for season 6. Don't get me wrong, I love their characters and their arcs, and the actors do just such an amazing job, and I understand what's led them to this point, but I definitely dislike them just as people now, and I agree that they're kinda soulless. Howard tells Jimmy that he can't help himself, and that he was born this way. Although Jimmy has been this way for a very long time, since a child in fact, he wasn't born this way. Jimmy was heavily influenced by the wolves and sheep flashback in season 2, which we know is a memory that he's carried into adulthood, due to him referencing it at the end of episode 602. There are wolves and sheep in this world, kid. Wolves and sheep. Wolves and sheep. Huh? Nothing. Not only that, but also due to his constant push to gain Chuck's approval and affection throughout his entire time in Albuquerque, only to be rejected and backstabbed time and time again. This pushed Jimmy to indirectly cause Chuck's death, something that he compartmentalized instead of processing and acknowledging the guilt that he played. Saul Goodman will always be slipping Jimmy at heart, but the way that Better Call Saul has shown us Jimmy's gradual character transformation into Saul makes it believable for the audience as to how he got to this point. Howard then tells Kim that she's one of the smartest and most promising people that he knows, and that he's baffled that she chose to go down Bad Choice Road with Jimmy like this, instead of advancing her already successful career along with pursuing her true dreams. So I hate to cut the breakdown to this scene in half, but in order to fully analyze the end of the episode and what comes next, we need to first discuss the cartel side of the show before returning to the ending, as both sides of the show combine by the end of the episode in a brutal fashion. But I'm far from done. So the episode starts out with Halalo crawling out of the Albuquerque sewers and going to a nearby truck stop to have a shower. I gotta say, out of the trucker showers I've seen, this has definitely got to be the nicest. We then get a little bit of PG Lalo fan service with him in the shower, and then he goes out into his car to have a power nap. This is a great callback to the season 5 finale where Lalo told Nacho that he never sleeps, only getting around 3 hours at a time, and that that's enough as being awake at night is when he really gets to ponder his thoughts. Another night owl, huh? You don't sleep? Mm, not tonight. Yeah, I never sleep much. An hour, maybe two. It's enough. When it's like this, that's when I can think. Lal then goes back into the sewers after his hour-long catnap. This is not only showing us that Lalo is back in New Mexico, but also shows that he's staking out the laundry location, implying that he got the information that he needed from Casper as we expected. Apparently, Albuquerque doesn't actually have sewers like this, and this is a set that the show creators made repurposing the set from inside the oil tanker with Nacho in episode 603. The next day, during the mediation con, we see Lalo in his sewer home recording a video for Donald Audio that never comes to fruition. Lalo greets Eladio by saying that he's alive and in downtown Albuquerque. He says he's been there for four nights, and that a little birdie told him the secret of Gus Fring's plans to build a secret meth super lab under a laundromat. Lalo says that Gus will have an excuse for it, and that Bolsa will back Gus up due to being such a huge earner for the cartel. Lalo says how he's going to go in that night, kill all the guards, and get proof. I assume that Lalo's making this tape so that he can send it out before he goes in, in case he doesn't make it out alive for real this time. I got to say I love this little Lalo vlog, something that I never thought I'd see. Tony Dalton absolutely kills it whenever he's on screen, even if it's a 4x3 aspect ratio. Lalo then goes to call Hector at Casa Tranquila to inform him of his plan, but gets put on hold and hears a subtle clicking on the line, realizing that the phones have been tapped. Lalo realizes that he just outed himself for still being alive to Gus, which was the only upper hand that he had. Lalo takes his anger out on his chair and it gets me every time. We all talk about poor Howie, but the real victim 
victim of the episode is Lalo's chair, the only piece of furniture in his cozy little sewer home. Anyways, Lalo calls back Hector, knowing that his cover is blown, so he might as well do something with it. He tells Hector that he plans to attack Gus that night, with Hector believing him, furiously ringing his bell in defiance of Lalo's plan, which just makes it that much more believable for Gus when he hears it. After hanging up from Hector, Lalo watches as the huge army of firepower leaves the laundry, including Mike. This is because they're going back to Gus's house where they think Lalo will attack. This proves that being made possibly wasn't so bad, because Lalo would have been walking straight into his real death if he would have went through with his original plan. So after Lalo sees Mike leave the laundry, Mike goes to speak to Gus, who's donating to a youth development charity. I love the consistency in seeing this public side of Gus interacting with his local community to build a positive reputation. This isn't the first time we've seen him do this in Better Call Saul, and he's known for doing this in Breaking Bad. Gus breaks away from the charity photo shoot and interview to hear Mike play the recording of Lalo, saying it happened 20 minutes ago. This confirms to Gus that his suspicions all season long were true, and that Lalo is still alive. Mike says that Gus needs to cut this charity donation interview short, as there's too many civilians here. Gus tells Mike that there's no way Lalo would attack him here, but Mike asks if he really wants to take that risk. Mike tells Gus to drive calmly home, and that he'll have men hidden on Gus the whole way. Mike adds that he pulled men off of all low priority targets targets, which is a key piece of dialogue for just a moment. Mike says that he has the laundry still covered, but aside from that, all of their men are waiting at Gus's house for Lalo to arrive, which we know from Lalo's perspective is a misdirect. This show is really playing into the he doesn't know that I know that he knows game well here in regards to Lalo knowing that Gus knows that he's alive, so Lalo is still using that to his advantage as much as he can to buy himself more time. Lalo knows that this will only buy him one more night of freedom before Gus and Mike realize that Lalo never attacked. So Lalo frantically thinks of a plan. He sees a cockroach in the sewers reminding him of Jimmy, and since Mike pulled his men off of all low priority targets, this means that Jimmy and Kim won't be protected like how they were in episode 509 Bad Choice Road. So back at Jimmy and Kim's apartment, Jimmy tells Howard that he's drank too much and that he'll call Howard a cab. Howard jokes about the fake compassion that Jimmy is showing and says that he's far from done. Kim starts cleaning up the drink glasses meant for the alcohol and tells Howard that he is done and that he needs to stop and go home. At this point in time, if Howard would have just turned around and left like they said, he could have gotten out of this situation alive and lived another day. But Howard does continue, realizing that they're perfect for each other, and that they get off on these cons and schemes. You have a piece missing. I, I thought you did it for the money, but now it it's so clear. Screw the money, you did it for fun you get off on it. Howard is 100% right, as I've discussed this multiple times already in other videos. Jimmy and Kim's relationship blossomed after their first cons in season 2, and they usually only ever show affection after scheming and conning, embracing each other and kissing either right before or after a con due to the excitement that it gives them. Howard goes slightly too far here saying, I'm gonna make it clear to everyone, because I'm gonna dedicate my life to making sure that everybody knows the truth. Believe it. Right in this moment, you see the candlelight flicker again, signifying that this is the exact moment that Lalo opened the apartment door and entered the room. Viewers have debated on how much of this convo Lalo heard between Howard, Jimmy, and Kim, and this is the answer. Lalo wasn't standing there the whole time, he didn't hear everything. It's true that Lalo could have heard something from the other side of the door before he opened it, but I don't think he was lingering around, I think that he actually just got there. Lalo only overheard from this point forward, as Howard tells Jimmy that they can't hide who they really are and then they look past Howard and are hit with a horrifying realization that Lalo is approaching. I love how we see Lalo's shadow behind Howard before getting the full Lalo reveal, but I will point out that we get this uncanny valley with Howard's head and face stuck in the same pose. It's like they either froze Howard's face here during editing or gave him a slow motion effect. I didn't really notice this until a viewer mentioned this to me on Twitter, and our eyes are supposed to be drawn to the Lalo shadow at this moment so you don't really notice it, but focusing on Howard it definitely feels odd as his face is stuck in that same pose for longer than a normal pause between sentences would be. Now, I love how horrified Jimmy is to see Lalo, showing all the trauma that he got from the end of season 5 rushing through his body with adrenaline. Jimmy and Kim's reactions to seeing Lalo are different, since Jimmy thought that Lalo was dead while Kim knew that Lalo was still alive due to Mike telling her in episode 604. Kim never told Jimmy this to protect him from his paranoia and trauma, but also to selfishly keep it from Jimmy so he'd be on his A-game and able to focus on the Howard Sand and Piper cons. Jimmy just says how, with Kim firmly telling Howard to leave. Tom Schnoz confirmed that Kim wasn't trying to cover up Jimmy saying how, and that this just shows their different reactions. How? Oh. Howard? Howard? Howard, you need to leave. 
Jimmy is stuck in shock, while Kim is trying to rationalize the situation, telling Harrod to leave before he gets involved with Lalo. Harrod asks who Lalo is, to which Lalo just responds saying he needs to speak to his lawyers. Harrod smirks, telling Lalo to get better lawyers, clearly still in the moment and unaware of how much of a threat Lalo truly is. Kim once again tells Harrod to leave, but Lalo interrupts, telling Harrod to take his time, as Harrod asks what this is all about, finally seeing the fear in Jimmy and Kim, and then Lalo takes out his pistol and starts screwing on the silencer. This is his Chekhov's gun moment, considering how we saw him do the same thing while in Werner's house at the end of episode 605, although Lalo thankfully never actually ended up using it against Werner's wife. Since we now see Lalo screwing on his silencer for a second time, my interpretation is that it's implied that this is a Chekhov's gun and that he's going to use it this time since he didn't before. As Kim struggles to even ask Lalo to tell him what he wants, he just shrugs it off by saying he wants to talk. Harrod realizes that he's now involved in something he shouldn't be, as if the gun wasn't obvious enough of a giveaway. Howard figures that he can talk himself out of this, but it's too little too late. Lalo shoots Howard right in the head, killing him instantly in front of Jimmy and Kim. This was possibly the biggest death of Better Call Saul history, being even more shocking than Nachos or Chucks. I visibly yelled, <laughs> Oh my God! While watching this, and sat with shock and awe for quite some time after the episode finished, just saying, what the F did I just watch, but in the best way possible. This is top tier TV, and the show creators have outdone themselves once again. This is excellent on so many levels, from tragically concluding Howard's sixth season character arc, having the two sides of the show clash into each other, along with showing Jimmy and Kim just how horrible the unintended consequences of their actions can be. I already have multiple videos discussing Howard's fate, so I'll try not to repeat myself but I love this death so much even though that I hate that Howard is now dead. Absolutely love how Tony Dalton just steals the show every time he's on screen, due to his incredibly charismatic yet intimidating attitude. I've said this before, but Lalo's smile secretly has razor sharp teeth, something that we just saw. I think that Lalo may be the best villain out of the entire Breaking Bad Better Call Saul universe, even possibly topping Gus Frank, but let me know what you think. The episode ends with Jimmy and Kim freaking out in denial that Howard was just shot right in front of them, with Lalo charismatic getting them to shush while saying, let's talk. Jimmy and Kim's reactions to Howard's death is horrifyingly perfect, with their sheer disbelief screaming out things such as no and oh my god, which I'm sure tons of viewers said along with them, I know I did. Lala wants to waste no time here, now able to finally talk to Jimmy and Kim with the distraction of Howard taken care of. Not only is Lalo's alias Jorge de Guzman wanted for skipping bail on a murder charge, Lala may know that his true identity has been revealed to the public and that his Jorge de Guzman alias has been busted. Needless to say, Lalo didn't want to leave any witnesses of him being in that apartment, which leaves Howard as a loose end that needed to be covered up. It's just crazy how Howard is just some random, meaningless guy to Lalo when he means so much to Jimmy, Kim, and the audience as a whole, and Lalo could have also killed him thinking that he was their friend when he was far from it and it was a lot more in depth than that. So without spoiling anything from Ozark, I will mention that this reminds me of a huge moment from that show. Those who have seen it know what I'm talking about, try not to spoil it in the comments though. So it's absolutely wild how Lalo can just flip a switch in his head to turn on and off his murderous tendencies, instantly switching between a charismatic center of attention to a sick, twisted, cold-blooded killer. I wonder if Lalo will use Howard's advice to get better lawyers against Jimmy and Kim, questioning them why Howard seemed to think this. Now I discussed Lalo's potential plans with Jimmy and Kim in a separate video, but I'd like to elaborate on one thing I said in that video. I mentioned that Lalo could use Jimmy being so surprised to see him as a leverage on Jimmy me knowing about the assassination attempt, but a counter to this would be the fact that it's now public knowledge that Lalo was killed in Mexico, in regards to the conversation that Kim had with Suzanne Erickson earlier this season. That being said, Erickson only figured this out due to the fact that Jimmy slipped up and said Lalo's real name to other ADAs, so could they use this public knowledge as an excuse to why they thought Lalo was dead? And if Lalo pushes on how they even connected the dots to his Jorge de Guzman alias, he may find out that Jimmy slipped up and said his real name by accident. Howard is clearly not the person that Jimmy Jimmy tells Francesca to talk to over the phone in the 4 or 5 Breaking Bad flash forward, so I wonder if that's actually Kim or some other minor character such as Cliff, Rich, or even Bill Oakley. Okay, and where are you going to be November 12th at 3 p.m.? I'll be there, but if it doesn't ring at 3 on the dot, I'm gone. Don't worry, it's going to ring. I'll definitely be watching Season 6 Part 2 in anticipation for an answer to this question, even if it's more simple than we think. Now, if the runtime to this video is any indication of how much I love this episode, it should be no surprise that I'm giving episode 607 a strong S tier. Thank God. 
this may be the best episode of Better Call Saul of all time, at least up until this point, but let me know what you think. Did you enjoy episode 607, Plan and Execution, more than 603, Rock and Hard Place, 509, Bad Choice Road, 508, Bagman, or even 305, Chicanery? This episode is the highest rated episode of Better Call Saul so far on IMDb, with a score of 9.9 out of 10, surpassing Chicanery, Bagman, Bad Choice Road, and Rock and Hard Place that all have a 9.7. This episode is also the highest rated episode out of all of Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, with only Ozymandias having a perfect 10 out of 10. During my Season 6 tier list, I'll be slightly rearranging my rankings for the Season 6 episodes, along with possibly adding a double S tier ranking, so look out for that and let me know what you'd rank each episode of Season 6 Part 1 in the comments below, along with any feedback for this episode. I'd appreciate a like on the video if you've enjoyed anything I've said today, and if you're new to the channel or just haven't yet already, subscribe and hit that bell notification to stay updated on when I post new content on Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad. Check out my Patreon or give a super thanks to help support the channel financially. If you got a few spare bucks lying around, it'd mean a lot, and thanks to those who have already. But most importantly, I thank you all so much for watching, and until next time, I'll talk to you guys later. Peace out. Thanks for your time. Hey, Jimmy. Howard. So, have you thought any more about the job? <laughs>